I've got the pleasurable job of introducing Chris this morning. Chris and I discovered we're um, colleagues at UTS. He's Associate Dean uh, in Indigenous Leadership and Engagement in the uh, uh, Science Faculty. So we're even in the same faculty, but since neither of us are hardly ever there, we haven't run into each other. <laughs> but Chris is uh, from the Kwandamuka people of Minjaba in Stradbrook Island in Queensland. He's got a fascinating background. His own training is in mathematics. But this has motivated him to explore the education of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and how they learn, particularly exploring the connections between mathematics and traditional knowledge. So he's a senior curriculum advisor for ACARA, which is the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, basically sets a national curriculum, and he's working closely with them to bring those traditional perspectives into the curriculum. And if you get a chance, you can read the longer version of Chris's bio in the communications that were sent. But I, for one, am very much looking forward to what Chris has to say today. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. I'll just fire up my computer. I just also wanted to start by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners and all the countries that we're residing on. I'm sitting actually here on Kwanamuka country. Uh, the traditional name for Cleveland is Nandibi. So I'm here at Nandibi. Um, that's where I, I live um, and I want to also pay my respects to um, all my past elders and ancestors as well as um, you know the work with that I do and, and many of us do is to is to teach the next generation and for me teaching the next generation of Aboriginal kids is really really important um, but for me you know we have to teach Aboriginal kids as Aboriginal kids um, having to say that what I'm saying there is that we're not you know the the same doing the same thing is not going to change anything. So we need to consider who they are as Aboriginal children to actually create a future for our children. Um, so what I'm saying there is also want to pay respect to them and knowing that they're going to be the leaders of our future. Um, the, I've entitled my talk here, Teaching Culture is Equal to Deep Learning. And one of the main reasons I do that, um, and I have the same title for ages at the moment, because um, I really want to push that point that um, and we often see Aboriginal perspectives in the curriculum as just a political correct movement. Um, um, and that's why it can be portrayed. Um, so what I really want to, to sort of give, give you an understanding of hopefully today is that if we're teaching from the cultural perspective or teaching from Aboriginal cultural perspective, that it will equal to deep learning in mathematics. And um, I want to share a few ways of actually doing that today. Um, um, so you can see hopefully the connections, but also the benefit of teaching in, in this way. And, and the benefit can actually stretch beyond Aboriginal kids from my, from my point of view. It can actually stretch across to any people who, you know, because we're all whole cultural beings. Um, so uh, so this, that's the title of my talk, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit of a journey or story to actually lead towards this understanding. Um, here is the, this is a place called Gumpi on Minjiraba. Um, this, um, I usually just put this picture up because it's one of my favourite spots. <laughs> it sort of gives you a sense of, you know, the country there, people don't know it. Um, and also that's me fishing in the background there, which is one of my favourite pastimes. Um, I don't do it very often now, unfortunately. Um, but this is part of my country and part of who, who I am. Um, um, and this, this particular site, Gumpi, has connections to what I'll be talking about later on. Um, because it's the site where the school's not very far off and it was the site where I did my first mass education project where I went back into my community to actually look at this connection between teaching mathematics and who we are as Aboriginal people. Um, but the first part of my life was actually looking at this equation. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, um, but my, 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 you know, my work in, in maths started with, with doing this through my honours and PhD. Um, so Rich's equations is about, you know, water flow through soils. So it was all to do with environment and protecting groundwater systems. And for me, as, as a young person coming up through that, through that education, that was the first time maths, so I could actually connect maths to the, to the world around us when we ran my honours. Um, but also more importantly, it was actually connected to actually protecting groundwater systems. Um, Strabrook Island was one of those places that were affected by mining, sand mining. Um, our waterways were affected by sand mining um, and that 
care for country was pretty much a part of my upbringing. Um, so when when the opportunity come to do that with uh, m mathematics, that's that's what really sealed it for me, in terms of really trying to understand how we you know how these partial differential equations are created, um, and for me how I can create numerical solutions to that um, through all those different numerical techniques. Um, but I suppose for me too, the the part of this equation here, the story around this equation is that the, the way I intersected with the mass community as an Aboriginal person. Um, I, I thought for many years that I was the only, only Aboriginal person in mathematics and, um, and happy to find over the years that there were, were a few of us, but just hiding in our separate little pockets. Um, but I suppose for me, um, it was a lonely experience, but it was also experience marred with people's opinions of who, you, who I am as an Aboriginal person. Um, either people would ignore my cultural background or ignore who it was in that sense, uh, you know, with the idea that we're just here to do maths, let's just get in and do, solve the problems. Um, but also there was a, um, a very obvious for me uh, interaction with people where they judged your ability to be able to do certain things and would actually um, talk to you as though you didn't really understand certain things when, when you actually did. Um, I was often confronted with that notion of not feeling accepted or being a part of that community in that sense. Um, and I also came to the point too where a lot of the stuff we do in applied mathematics was actually benefiting industries, um, getting to understand that better. And that then started to to conflict with my values on how on how um, we should be interacting with the environment, how we should be protecting the environment. Um, and I, and I found that hard to to negotiate at that point in time. Um, what happened then was there was an opportunity for me to actually start looking into mass education for our kids, because um, all the stats often tell us that uh, Aboriginal kids are two years behind their counterparts. But for me, that was didn't seem to be right because I, I knew how smart a lot of our kids are. Um, a lot of the time we were, um, the, the metrics of schools didn't fit within our kids. Um, the school itself didn't fit within our kids, the way they're teaching. Um, and, and it didn't really reflect what the kids were capable of, of doing. So this sort of set me on this pathway to think about, well, what is it? How would you teach maths differently? Because um, I had a, quite a traditional maths education where you, you know, you did the, the procedures, you did the problems. Um, but I suppose if you had more of an insight and talent for that, you could actually see the far reaching implications of what you were doing or, or have a more of an appreciation for that. Like for me, I, I, I learned, um, I taught myself how to program computers from a very young age. Um, I was even doing numerical integration and things like that from a very young age. Um, but I also marvel at how a lot of these environmental patterns emerged when you're actually dealing with, with that sort of mathematical modeling world. So that sort of got me that hook in for me. Um, but I wanted to have more for Aboriginal kids than that. I wanted them to know that they themselves are very intelligent, smart children. They come from intelligent, smart people, and there is a connection with what we're doing in the mathematics. So really, I had to think about two things when I started my maths education project back in my community. I had to think about what is culture, but then how does that intersect with the idea of what mathematics is? And the way I explored that, I actually was doing a lot of professional developments for teachers um, um, and just exploring ideas, really, with, with a whole group of different teachers. And um, they, were, they were teachers already in service, and they were also some were um, pre-service pre teachers. So the things I used to throw up on the board were stuff like, what is culture? And I get them just to brainstorm the idea of what culture actually is. And generally you'd get stuff that was written in this iceberg. I'm hoping you can see that text. Um, but basically I use this iceberg model. And the model for, for this is that within culture, there's many things that are intangible, which is below the water. So this is the above the water in the iceberg, and this is below the water. So this is the visible and this is the, the intangible start parts of culture. Um, so you have many of those intangible things that will, um, you know, like your philosophy, your beliefs that actually will inform how you practice your culture, how you express your culture. So the top bit is about expression, expressing your culture through your art, through the way you prepare food, eat food, 
know, the stories you tell, the language you speak, you know, your dance, your music and so forth. All that is informed by what is underneath that iceberg, that your philosophy, your spirituality, your history and so forth. So once you experience, once you actually are, you know, um, communicating who you are through the way you express yourself, there is also an opportunity to learn from other people, but also other situations around you. So the idea of putting yourself down and expressing yourself then also maps back down onto an opportunity to reflect on what you believe or what your, how you perceive your history, you know, and so forth. Um, now this, this for me is the evolution of culture that we always do and every culture has always done. And I always argue that Aboriginal people have been doing this on this on, on Australia for over 80,000 years or so. So this, this evolutionary cycle is very, very, very important. Um, the other part of it for me is that it happens at all different scales, at the individual scale, at a community scale, at a nat nat national scale. And one of the things that, um, 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 situations that you could actually talk about in that context is that, you know, should, should, we, should, we, be, should we be celebrating Australia Day on the 26th of, of January. I'm not, I'm not don't want to get into that debate, but what I'm trying to say here is that, um, you know, people will express their views in, in all different ways around that. And that gives you other people an opportunity to hear what they say and then maybe reevaluate what they believe. Um, so they do have an opportunity to, you know, to change or to change the way they do things and that may be to celebrate it or it might be, um, you know, they decide not to celebrate it and so forth. So this cycle is very, very important. And as I said before, you know, we, you know, Aboriginal Australia has created a whole society over 80,000 years by doing that. And this Tyndale map people might be familiar with, but it sure gives you an indication what Australia used to look like with all the different nations across Australia. This over to the right hand side here is just my little small part of Australia where our community comes from. Um, and it actually translates to a very small pink area just on the edge here, which is actually part of this bigger pink area, which they call Jaguar country as well. So this is, this sort of gives you the scale of, of all of that as well. Um, so the, the next question I usually ask as pre-service teachers is, is a question of, of oh, sorry, no, I will, I will go into the next bit. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I was thinking I was into something else. Now, the interesting thing here is that if we go back here, one of the things that we, that everyone says is history. So history really informs who we are. So this here is what Australia used to look like or used to be recognized as and still does by, by many Aboriginal people. But what happened as part of our history is that we have this notion of terra nullius, where it's part of our shared history, our relationship. So this has shaped the way that we do things and where we, where, where we perceive things. So basically in that space, we have non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people put into two separate camps. Um, so this means that um, we're quite separate still in my view, that we have non-Indigenous people over here, Indigenous people over here. And over history, non-Indigenous people have been positioned as the advanced society who would come with all the knowledge and all their language, their culture is valued. And that's the way non-Indigenous people have been positioned. On the other side of that coin, we have Indigenous people who actually been, been um, positioned as marginalized, dispossessed, devalued. And this comes from this word terra nullius. So I'm, I should have said, maybe some people don't know, but terra nullius means land belonged to nobody. It is the doctrine that Australia was colonized on. So it actually, said that Aboriginal and Torres people were not a people. Um, and, and in 1901, when the Australian constitution was drawn up, Aboriginal people were placed as part of fauna and flora in that, in that con con constitution. So we weren't considered a people. And that's because that we were actually considered the most primitive race on the planet. Even in, if you look up any encyclopedia in the 1970s, you'd still see that you know, you see a picture of an Aboriginal person and they say the most primitive race on the planet. So this has actually put us through history in Australia as being that, um, as being a lesser version of non-Indigenous person or a primitive version of, of man is what, what people usually say. 
So what generally happens in this space too, is that non-Indigenous people will actually impose what they believe should happen for Indigenous people. And there are many, many instances of that. Um, one of the classics is in the Northern Territory intervention. You know, you could even say that, you know, that the education system has been imposed on us as well. So there's many instances of that. So what usually happens in that space, so like any good physics lesson, if any, one force goes one way, you usually get equal and opposite force going back the other way. And this has led to the, to the history that we have had of trying to get people to hear from our perspective, where we got protests on the street, where it's Uluru statement from the heart, you know, all that sort of stuff is about getting us to listen to our voice. But either which way, what happens in that middle bit is a lot of tension, there's a lot of fear and anxiety within that. And when I usually talk about this in the teacher space, I've actually talked to teachers about connecting with their local Indigenous communities. And a lot of the time they will say those things like, I'm too frightened to, I'm, I'm, I'm frightened that I might do something wrong. Or, you know, they might see, think I'm a right, right, right racist if I do that wrong thing or whatever it is. Um, and there's also, and also with fear, there comes a lot of mistrust as well. We don't quite trust each other in that relationship. And this is a real thing. If you, you know, there's a thing called the reconciliation barometer, they actually get a representative sample of Australia. And this is one of the questions they ask is, you know, is there, a, do, do you believe there's a trusting relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people in Australia? And still to this day, more people lean towards the, the, the there is not trust within that real relationship. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that there is an obvious tension within that space. And even if you, above when I was talking about it you know that that tension was real for me in that space um, they might not be in real for other people they might have thought themselves just being curious but for me I could feel that tension of, of who I was as an Aboriginal person in this in this society in that in that group um, I will acknowledge the fact there is a lot of goodwill in that space um, but again I always say to people just check to make sure your goodwill is not an imposition Goodwill only really is, is works well if you actually work with Aboriginal people towards things, um, not just imposing your ideas on people, but actually work through the ideas with people. Um, and the other thing I wanted to really highlight with this terra nullius is this notion of silencing. Um, and I want to give you some clear examples because what I'm trying to say here is that in that iceberg, the history has shaped the way we interact and do things. It shaped we, the way we interact within our education system, um, um, with any, you know, within the health system or any part of the of the Australia you want to think about. Um, and I want to give some examples about how terra nullius actually infiltrates its way through into some decisions. Um, one of the classic things for me is this idea of David Unipin. Um, I don't know if anybody knows much about him, but he was an Aboriginal man born in 1872 and he died in 1967. So he actually died before, before Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were considered a people in the country because the, the uh, referendum didn't happen until 1967 actually, so the year he died. Um, but what David Unipe and his, he's actually from the Nanajiri people, which is down the bottom of the Kurong. He, he actually had a keen interest in science. He had a keen interest in, being, in, in inventing things. So he, he was quite talented, as a as a as an engineer and as a designer and you can see on the note here he has this schematic here and this schematic actually relates to oh i'm sorry didn't mean to take that how do i go back there we are so this schematic um is actually for the shearing shears um so he actually improved the hand shears so that it can be more effective there was a um a, a mechanical driven shear before he he um made this alteration um but he the the shear actually worked too much on a rotational basis and would um tangle up the wool so his invention actually translated that rotational motion into the sideways planar motion um, so every time you get your hair cut, the fact that the clippers are going backwards and forwards and that plan of motion is actually from his invention. Um, so for me, he actually revolutionized the shearing industry. Um, and, and when I was going through school, learning your social studies, um, you know, he, he, you learn that Australia's economic development happened off the sheep back, you know, 
So he was actually instrumental in making sure that Australia's economic development, economic development occurred off the, off the sheep, sheep's back. Um, so for me, he revolutionised the shearing industry, but he's not really well known. We don't teach him about him in any aspect of the curriculum at this point in time. Um, so his, his whole story is silenced. Um, he has been honoured on the $50 note, obviously, but we, people still don't know about him. Um, which sort of breaks my heart a bit because he, he did so much. He, uh, he actually, um, I read one article where they say that he died a very unhappy man because he was never recognised for the things he did. He actually um, wrote down many, many uh, um, ways you could do inventions. One of them was actually for the laser as well. He actually said that you could have a laser. Um, he actually um, wrote down the um, prototype of a helicopter before anybody else. Um, based on aerodynamics and the boomerang, and there's, and there's many, many other of, of his writings like that. So he's never really re recognised for his intelligence. The bottom part here was that he was actually also an author, so he used to write a lot of stories, and he was the first published um, Aboriginal person in the uh, Western sense, you know, through through new, new newspapers and magazines and so forth. So he actually was a published person. Now the thing, if you actually remember, here we have a schematic, we have his writings. You do have a church where he comes from his community and not in Jerry country, which was an important part of his life because he was a Christian. And I think these were his parents here. Um, but if you go to the next iteration of the note, you'll see that he has been taking, he's actually been stripped of all his icons in this next part of the note. He's actually, for me, he's almost like his position back in fauna and flora with just the swans from that are prominent down where his countries are. He's still got the church um, and he do have some knowledge of his shields. There's necessarily nothing wrong with that because that's part of who he is. But his invention, his writings have been wiped from the note. Um, so I suppose I'll leave as a question for everybody is why would the Reserve Bank do that to, to an Aboriginal person? Is this the notion that Aboriginal people still have to be positioned as that native, as that primitive? You know, why would you take away his, his, his uh, scientific inventions? Why would you take away his writings? Um, to me, that was really sad when I saw that for the first time. So I'll leave that thought with you. The other part of here is also the idea of number. And I don't know if many people heard of Aboriginal people's relationships with mathematics or number, but number is, um, um, in terms of Aboriginal people, are often viewed as only having a very limited number system where we say one, two, three and, and lots or big mob or whatever the word is that people use. Um, and that has come through that notion of, of through, the, through anthropology from the 1800s to the early 1900s where anthropologists were um, um, translating language but also believing they were seeing a primitive version of a math system. Um, now, interestingly, in this website I got here, there was this fellow called Harris who was actually trying to spill the, dispel the myth in 1982 that Aboriginal people had a limited sense of number. Um, and he said that the anthropologists had these three misconceptions, that no Aboriginal language have number words beyond two or three, the belief that these words mark the limits to counting, and also that the limited numbers equals the fact that they are primitive, that they're co 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 cognitively impaired. So that was the message that was coming out of these anthropologist type writings. But Harris himself actually documented many, many situations where Aboriginal people were trading in high numbers, children were playing games in high numbers. Um, and even for me, where I come from in our language, they, we have a five base number system. Um, we do only have uh, words for one and two but you use combinations of them and we have a, a word that groups in five. So that way we can have a combinations, you know, have any number you like, because we can actually have a grouping number by five. It's almost like the anthropologist did, he didn't even ask the question, do you, can you group or do you have a grouping name? Um, as I talked to more Aboriginal people, there's different um, base number systems. Um, I've heard of a three base system, um, but a five base seems to be the most common at this point in time. I'll give you one, um, Oh, yeah, that's what I said here. Most Aboriginal languages have a five base number structure. And for me, if we're going to teach this, this is an opportunity where we could actually be learning about Aboriginal trust on the number system as general. 
you know, from Aboriginal people as well as non, non-Indigenous kids. Um, and, and from that, you could actually learn how to translate, say, between base five and base 10. Um, and that transferability would be a much richer mass education in my mind. Um, um, and also you get an understanding that, you know, dispelling the myth that Aboriginal people didn't have any connection with number. And as that Aboriginal child grown up in an education system, they can actually see themselves as more part of that, of that world of maths and number. Um, what is mathematics is what I wanted to get into. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. I, want, I don't want to talk too much because I do have a bad habit, as you already probably realised. Um, but for me, what is mathematics goes, um, this is my little version of it, because I actually was had been thinking about it. I do normally do a workshop with pre-service teachers about what is mathematics, but I've left it out of this talk because I would have been talking too long. Um, and and this connection to culture. But for me, this is this is what it's really all about. And, and you know, happy to take people's views on that. So really for me, maths is taking some, is looking at our reality and the way we perceive our reality. We take some part of it, we go through an abstraction process and we actually create this world that we call mathematics. Um, and for me, mathematics is, is very much a constructivist thing where a whole range of people over a whole, you know, a whole period of time from different cultures have actually created this world that we called maths. Um, so maths really is a, is a person made thing and we really need to have a process where we can critically reflect on the maths that we see against the re re yeah, 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 reality that we're, we're interested in or even some other part of that reality. Um, so what I often argue for, for to maths teachers is that we still sit in this maths cloud when we teach mathematics. And that's why we get some of the comments from, te from, from students about what am I learning this for? Um, I'm never going to use this again. You know, what does it mean to me? Uh, type, type of things. Because we sit too much in this mass cloud. We get a lot of, lot of students who do set, set problems in textbooks or by the teacher. Um, so we're not actually speaking to, to, the, to the actual student at all. We're just getting them to go through procedures and trying to tackle a whole bunch of problems. Um, when I first saw this, when I first drew this down, I was actually sitting in, in Gumpi country near the school. For all the years I've been doing mathematics, I never really associated this notion of being creative with it. Because when I actually thought about this cloud, I thought there's many, many things you can put in that cloud. And one of them for me was art. You know, um, in my previous life, I used to do a lot of artwork. Um, so for art was the thing that jumped straight into my head. Um, and I thought to myself, we should theoretically be able to teach mathematics so that students have an opportunity to express who they are, to express their cultural values, their culture, the way they want to see the world, all that sort of stuff should, could, could be come through in, in the teaching and learning of mathematics. So one of the first things I want to do was really play with that idea. You know, how can we create creativity in the classroom so that kids can self-express themselves just like it would for a piece of art. The other aspect of that is symbolism. Symbolism for me takes the meaning from our reality into the world. And I think in mass education, we don't do enough about teaching those explicit symbols and what they mean and what they mean when they're actually together with a whole bunch of other symbols as well. So we don't really teach that very well. Um, we take a lot of that stuff for granted, I think. And the other part of this model is that it's all cultural bias and that's not a bad thing. That's actually part of the, who we are as people. Anything that we create as a people will be biased to our culture. Um, but the important thing is to actually recognize that it does exist. And when you can actually recognize those cultural bias within the, in the mass world, it actually, for me, opens up a whole different range of ways of looking at mathematics, and the, and and it, you know it, it expands it out for people. It doesn't. It's not so rigid and tight that you can actually play around with some more ideas. Um, yeah. So this thing here that I've developed is called the Gumpy model, which I wanted to keep the connection back to the country where I created it, but also a notion of keeping connections is I wanted to develop a a way of teaching so that the process is still alive as well. The students engage in that circular process, but in doing that, they actually really engage in what the meaning of this math is in terms of the way they perceive their reality as, as, as a student. 
So I'm going to give you a quick overview of um, linear equations, the way we can tackle linear equations. Um, I sort of um, tease a lot of the uh, primary school teachers in particular. I want to throw this one up. I say, I'm going to teach you this today. And they asked them how many people are uncomfortable about that because mass anxiety is a real problem. Um, and and uh, a lot of them are a bit uneasy and uncomfortable. But I said, well, what we're going to do is I sort of make the point that this representation is what a lot of students will see for the first time. And it doesn't have too much meaning for them. I then talk about the fact that growing patterns has been one of those ways of seeing, of moving away from that, to actually looking at some sort of constructed pattern like this. Um, and what students have to do is write a number sequence for that, which is not usually not that hard because it's just they're counting the squares on each of those numbers. Um, but what they've got to do from the number sequence is then create some sort of linear from that, um, which can be quite a co co cognitive jump. Um, I experienced, I sort of saw a talk in Seoul about that you know, many years ago where, where American academics were studying that, how students were making that translation between that number sequence and, and to the, to the equation. Um, but I thought to myself, we, if we actually can, can bring the connection stronger, just like in the Gumpy model, we can actually create something that builds the connection between the structure of the equation to the patterning. I wanted to use numbers to emphasize that structure rather than just having a series of numbers you've got to sort of think through to yourself and then connect that to the symbolism of the equation as well. And I thought to myself, if I could do that, then I should be able to go, I should be able to give the students any linear equation and they should be able to draw some sort of sort of growing pattern for me. And to me, this was the first attempt at seeing what creativity could happen if what would happen if you allow kids to create like going from the equation themselves into creating some representation of, you know, for themselves of how they perceive growing and, and in connection to that equation. So just to give you a quick look, this is, I won't go through this in any detail, but this is how I'm building those connections. I give a quite a detailed pattern. I usually do something like a spiral. If you look, if you Google growing patterns, they're always like rectangles and boxes. So I wanted to use a pattern that you see in the world around you. And I often get kids to talk through where spirals are represented in the world. Um, they talk about plants, they talk about galaxies, they talk about water going down the plug hole, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm already building that connection to their reality. Um, but then I also delineate between two things that happen within that, within that patterning, that things that are staying the same and things that are growing. Um, and the top series of numbers on the top of those panels is the, is the, is the time sequence. So I call them days. Um, and the very bottom is the size of our spiral. So I'm saying to them that you can actually construct this bit from the constant, what bit is growing to then get the size of your spiral and making the explicit connection between time when you're doing that and, and more meaning for that symbol of D um, and how that is connected within that equation. Um, so they get an understanding of that, which is also the same as that. But then I challenge them. This is the most important bit for me is to, if you get more something like this, S is equal to 5D plus two, I want you to create a pattern for yourself. And I, I usually say that, you know, I want you to be creative, create anything you want, as long as you got to, got to, it represents that equation. I, I also reinforce the fact that this part here determines the growing, this is the, the constant and this five here, it tells grows and so forth. Anyway, what's more important is what students actually do. I'll give you, this is a, a, a professional development I did in Perth. Um, and the reason this is important for me is that I, I, was, I was teaching a group of Aboriginal um, um, education workers who are trained to be uh, uh, t t teachers. <coughs> and um, one of the, the uh, um, Aboriginal education workers niece joined us for the for the workshop and so we had a workshop together around this idea of growing patterns and linear equations and connecting to the culture of the kids and so forth um, and she sat through that and did the activities with us um, the, t the 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 auntie her auntie had to go off and do another class and she said why you do the class can you just draw on the board um, while I'm doing this just keep yourself busy and then 
what happened is they, the auntie come and ran, ran over to me and grabbed me to look at these whiteboards that she was doing. So this, this girl was in grade three. So this is a grade three student, Aboriginal student, and she just engaged in all this drawing, creating her own equation for each of these drawings that she was doing. And then she even started verbalizing what she, what she liked about it. I love maths because I know it and think it really easy, but sometimes a little hard, in my opinion. And there's a whole lot of more stuff on that board. But what I suppose I wanna reinforce here is that when I started seeing this year three student doing this stuff that we don't trust students to do until they're in about grade eight, um, I, you know, I was really taken aback um, by the engagement that the student had, um, the understanding the student had, um, um, and, and just the willingness to, to keep on drawing and, and being part of that mass world by looking at this idea of patterning. Another important story, it was from Amanda Petter from Roma Mitchell's secondary college. Um, and she was in a PD with me and she wanted to try this idea out. And she tried it out on a, on a group of disengaged year 10 boys, uh, a classroom full of them, this is her words. And she rang me up and the first thing she said to me, I've never had this level of conceptual understanding before. Uh, as I said, there was a maths class of disengaged year 10 boys. And she said uh, she was remarkable that they even wanted to do this. And she thought they wouldn't even, they'll just balk up at being at drawing anything because they were full of bravado and the rest of it. So they didn't think they'd actually get any drawings out of them at all. Um, and she said, I was astonished at what they drew. Now I'm just going to give one example here because I think this is one of the best examples I've seen for a while. And the student had actually been influenced by the foster care system. Um, I should say that the, the class was a multicultural group um, and there's only one Aboriginal child within that class. So this is not a drawing from an Aboriginal student, but it was actually from a multicultural group. This uh, child had been influenced by the foster care system. So he saw that the two constants in his life were these two carers, but also these two carers each year, so he changed the time scale of the year, um, was, was, was developing this community each year of five children, they're, they're influencingly, influencing positively over the years. So from the upshot from that is the fact that, I mean, it's an, just really interesting that a student wanted to share that part of his life, share how he sees that as a growth and a positive thing. Um, 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 but also, you know, Amanda's saying there was, there was a much deeper conceptual understanding because they actually owned that. So two days later, Amanda said she set a quiz for them um, she had a question based on those ideas and she, her next thing she said is they uh, outsmarted me and asked really intelligent questions. And what, what actually happened, um, the way she relayed to me was that the question she set uh, wasn't quite right. Um, they said it was, the students said it was ambiguous and they, she had to fix it up. So she fixed it up <laughs> and, and, and let them set the test after that. Um, I, 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 I sort of cheekily said that you probably should have just passed them anyway. Um, so to me, that was a level that, you know, a really good indication of that, of that um, conceptual understanding. It really helped break the deep cycle of disengagement for many of them is what I also heard from that, um, from her saying that once she'd actually engaged with that notion of creativity, allowing them to share part of their life and themselves, the way they see the world, um, there was that, that breaking down and more, more engagement within the classroom. Uh, and also forming relationships much easier. I want one more example of, and we're gonna move more into Aboriginal space here, because one of the, one of the ancient ways that we taught in, in Aboriginal culture was through dance. Um, Kagoon Fogarty and me had been doing a few different ideas um, around teaching maths through, through dance. This is Kagoon here holding the boomerang. Um, and this here was a workshop we did in Gombangia country, which is around Coffs Harbour. Um, and this group of people here uh, run an organisation that's really keen on tourism and education for their kids. Um, so we got a, they got a group of teachers together and we did a PD session with them, but also did stuff with it with the children. So the stuff we did with the children is that we actually danced all together their, their, their Guinea Gay song, which is their welcome song, where everyone is expressing themselves, you know, you know basically the song is about welcoming people onto country. Um, 
So all the students knew it, the adults knew it, and we all got up together to dance it. So once we all sat in the mats behind, and we, and then I said to them, well, let's look at the structure of the dance. Let's, you know, assign some, some ideas to the different movements of the dance. So for example, there's one movement called Yinige, which we represented as a G. So we know we start the dance with this three lots of Yinige, um, and then the U is becomes who are you? And it's not a particular move about asking about who are you, who are you coming onto this country type thing. And we knew we had to do this twice. So the upshot of this, without going too deeply into it, is that once you know the the students were really excited to see their structure of their dance represented in this different form, but the most interestingly is that they could see and understand what each of those structures were. Um, so you're almost teaching that idea of bod mass that we 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 sort of drill kids with, um, but in a more we're doing this in a more creative way. You're actually getting them that understanding with because they already know that structure or understand that structure. Um, and the things that come out of that was that um, if I go back to the picture, um, Clark here is one of the people who run the organization and one of the dancers from, from Guinea a cultural man. Um, he had a daughter that did this drawing and he was absolutely excited that she did that drawing. Um, and to us, it might not look much when I felt a little, I was sort of a bit confused, but when he explained the fact that each of these symbols was something that she created and put together to represent stuff to create her own dance. Like this, and um, this, sorry, I should actually say that her, his daughter hadn't even started school yet. So this is a young child, not started school yet, looking at the ideas of numbers and connecting to abstract symbols. And this one here for her was, was, was hitting um, clap sticks together. Um, and again, this is another number doing a kangaroo move. I think the symbol was um, and so forth. So each one of these had a meaning to that student and she put together in a structure that she said was her dance. Um, so for me, that then again shows how ready kids are to accept that abstract world that we call it, how, we, how they can connect numbers to concepts and ideas and create symbolism around that. And I've got really excited about that sort of idea. Um, I'm gonna run out of time. But I want to just quickly introduce you to this idea. There's actually some papers that we can send through your society that I wrote in the teacher mag, if you have not seen it already, around these ideas. Um, but I really wanted to share the fact that there is some people, uh, I mean, the, the, Dr. Unipingu, Dr. Mandawar Unipingu was the first Yungul principal, which is Aboriginal principal at Yirrkala Community School, and that's up in Arnhem Land. But he, if people know, you might remember him as the lead singer of Yothi Indi. So he was a teacher and a principal first. So he was a trained teacher and become principal of that school. He was keen to connect the, the knowledge systems of the West to the Aboriginal knowledge systems, looking at them, their connections, because um, he wanted their children to learn both ways so they can actually function in this world, to be strong in who they are as an Aboriginal person or a Yongle person in their knowledge as songs and dance, um, and then connect that to the knowledge systems that come to the shore. So he said that the strongest connection between Aboriginal knowledges and Western knowledge is mathematics in his view. And he went as far as saying that our mathematics, Yungle mathematics is Gurutu. So Gurutu is about kingship. Um, now we gotta, gotta understand that Aboriginal kingship is not just relationships between people. The philosophy, uh, the philosophy that Aboriginal people across all of Australia went by was that we built kingship to all the elements of the world. Um, so we had been build kingship to animals and plants, build kingship to fire, build kingship to wind, water, and so forth. So all the elements of the world. So what you're essentially doing is that you're building a personal kingship with the complex system of the world. And from doing that process, you get these complex categories, um, which here, the first level is called moiti, yiri jandua up there all the way down to what you might heard of skin groups down here, down the bottom here. But the way that these kingship groups are actually, how people are placed within them comes down to these sort of systems where I called them Yothi Indi cycles. So it's about mother child and your mother gives you your skin group, but all of them are in, within cycles, which is the fundamental point. So you've got two independent cycles 
And then once you have certain rules around who can actually marry and so forth. So what I'm trying to get people understanding of is that from that philosophy of building an intimate connection with the comp to the, 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 the complex systems of the world or all the elements of the world, you get these complex um, kingship systems that then eventually connect to them. Now, what I'm showing you here is the Malk system, which is only the very first level. So this is like the early childhood level. But having said that, you can see that they are uh, systems within themselves that students have to understand how to think around two different cycles and across two different cycles um, to see how they're connected and related to people within their community. But then again, back down to their clan and to the country they're connected to as well. So what I'm trying to get an understanding of is that, that Dr. Yunapingu saw this very strongly as a form of mathematics. And for me, once I delve more deeply into it, you can see very much the strong connection between the way maths is constructed as a system and how this is constructed as a system as well. Um, I might leave it at that because I know people might want to have questions. I've got, only got 10 more minutes. Um, so thank you for listening to me. Um, there's a lot more that I could have said in that regard, um, but I hope you got something from, from my talk today. So thank you. Chris, thank you very much for that. For that. It's fascinating. Uh, we have a fair number of people here. So probably the easiest thing is if you have a question, um, just so we're not talking about, uh, across each other, maybe raise your hand and then I'll keep my eye out here to see who's got a question. So uh, just use the uh, little hand raise thing. And if you can't find it, just jump in. Uh, wait to see if there's a question. Um, while we're just waiting there, um, I do have a question. Um, so it's interesting that the examples that you showed, which I found quite fascinating, they definitely had, they had a strong uh, visual graphical component. And even the graphics that you used often kind of linked back into what you might think of as traditional art and so on. And I guess I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that, because I think there's actually a much broader, uh, very important concept there that just in general, when we're trying to get any kids interested in mathematics, the, the usual ways we teach it can be a bit dry. And the more that you can make mathematics Feel, make kids feel connected, that it has some reality in their lives, the better. And in particular, connecting mathematics through uh, appealing arts and graphics and so on is incredibly powerful. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Are there broader things that we could think about? Are there broader things that ASEMS could do? Are there people around more generally thinking about that art and mathematics connection? That yeah, I, th I think... Um... Um, for me, it's, it's, it's a bit more than just art, I think, I, I think, um, because what we are, I'm them doing something that's quite, quite, uh, gra gra graphical, I suppose, from the examples I've shown you, but the thing that I think is the real thing, the real sort of, um, connection for Aboriginal kids is that when we grow up in our, in our communities, we will talk a lot about the patterns in the world around us, you know? Um, what we get in school is we get a very dry, now let's count to 10, let's do this, let's do that, you know, type thing, you know, to, to the point where we start learning processes in algebra. Um, they're all teacher constructed. There's, there's nothing, no room to actually think for yourself. Um, so what I'm trying to say here, what, what I think the real connection is, you know, it might've been expressed through dance and through something else is, is to, um, look for that strong connection to the world around us and that interests kids. Um, one example I will, I will give is that um, I'm working with a teacher at Remark, which is a, a regional community in South Australia, which has a lot of Aboriginal kids in the school. And I, I just got them to go out and look for patterns in the world. So they went out in the, in the schoolyard, went out in the bush and they were just taking photos of all different things. And then raising the question, well, well why would it exist like that? You know. You know, um, and one beautiful thing was around symmetry, where they're looking at why things are symmetric. You know, why would, um, if you draw a line down a lizard, a goanna, why would that be symmetrical? You know? 
you know, and, and they come up to reason that, you know, well, it has to be a risk. They wouldn't be able to run, <laughs> wouldn't be able to do yeah. this, wouldn't be able to do that, you know. And then they started thinking about stuff from the ocean, you know, and, and actually come up by, by themselves that they, the things have that uh, ra ra radial symmetry, yeah. you know, and why that exists, you know, is that questioning of why that exists in relation to the world that we, we, we're in, you know. Um, and I, for me, I mean, um, I might get shot down here, but I, I believe mathematics, you know, has born, is born from that, that, those connections, you know, from looking and thinking about all of those patterns that we see around us, you know, yeah. um, and, and this idea of pure mass developed afterwards and looking at sort of number structures and quite abstract things. But originally me for uh, mathematics is about that. Um, um, and I think we don't engage our kids, any of our kids within that enough. Um, and and it's, it that doesn't benefit all kids, but in, in particular, it it it, it um, disadvantages Aboriginal kids more more generally. Um, I, hope, I don't know if I answered your question, but no, that that's that's great, Chris. I think there's probably a lot more we could tease out there, but I see we have another question here. So, like uh, Adrian Barnett's got a question, Adrian. Oh, hi, Chris. Thank you. That was really interesting. I was just really struck when you said that the base five system was very popular. I just wondered if there's any ideas about why. Base five works so well here. Was it some kind of interaction with the environment, or any any ideas on that? I, th I think it's more physiological with the hands, because yes. even even the word five is connected to hands originally. Uh, same with the words of digits. So I think there's a there's a natural propensity for humans to actually use your bodies to to, to count and to do things. There's actually more intimate um, body counting systems from different communities where they start using lines on hands and things like that. Um, actually, there's an interesting one I just learned the other day from the Gringy people. They actually created individual names all the way to 50. Um, I'm not quite sure the full extent of that and why they wanted to do that, but they did. Um, there, there was a suggestion that it was more precise. There's, there's more precision in doing that, um, as you can understand it. But I don't know whether they went beyond that, whether they, they started using it as a grouping thing or not. I have no idea. Yeah, we've got questions are starting to fly in now. We've got a question from Nick Tierney and then a question from Matt Rowan. So Nick, go ahead. We have just about uh, six more minutes, seven more minutes. Okay, great. Um, Chris, thanks so much. That was, uh, that was just like amazing. Um, I was wondering where we can learn more about like your pedagogical approaches. Is there like a uh, is there is there a book or is there like a place we can go to? No, there's, there's some of my failings that I haven't really developed up enough to share. Um, <laughs> okay. But I'm getting there. I'm getting there slowly. I'm trying to get money to do it really is what I was trying to do. Um, uh, but what we are going to be doing over the next year is um, develop more resources. I'm, I'm the chair of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Mathematics Alliance. So anyone's welcome to join. There's free membership at this point in time. Um, we're going to be changing websites soon. So part of the redevelopment of the website will be a resource, devoted resource page. We do have one already, but we're going to ramp up a bit. Um, and um, start sharing those stories. The other thing I'm going to be doing too is I'm working, I'm setting up a process where I'm working with about five different schools across Australia, five or six, I think. Um, and as we go, as I work through ideas with teachers and they trial it and we go through that sort of process, they're going to, we're going to co-create resources so other teachers can see as well. Um, so that's in the in the train. Um, there are other resources at the moment called the Mac Account Project. We can have a look at some. There's some good stuff in there. Um, but at the moment, in terms of mass education, there's I couldn't really. There's nothing that's really. Um, I haven't seen that's not you know what you'd normally would see over the years. You put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, so thank you so much for that. I had um, just one more question. I was wondering, like you mentioned that you were teaching programming, like that you were learning about programming like when you were younger. I was wondering yeah. how you do you see like the role of computing and programming like for younger students in like relation to what you're teaching is um Oh I, I think yeah. technology Aboriginal people seem to have real um really big pickup with technology. Um um where probably one I think the uh, it'd be interesting to find that paper but Someone did a study saying, saying that we picked up on Facebook, social media much, much faster than many other pop populations, that sort of thing. Um, so with that goes the idea of working with phones and working with iPads and all sorts of things. And an earlier example of that mm -hmm. is actually um, motor, motor vehicles. There's a, there's a beautiful little book that's written, who's heard of the, um, the Bush Mechanics? There's an ABC thing called the Bush Mechanics. Um, it's about the Central Desert people. 
Um, but there was a book written about it as well. And that gives some of the history. And the Central Desert people were actually owning motor cars before the mission managers. And they were getting upset writing letters into their into their heads of the department saying, why are these black fellows got cars and I don't? <laughs> so the, the reason they found it important, because obviously with the vast distances they travel in the desert country, they, they really wanted a car because <laughs> it got to places quicker. So they, from that, they, they took up cars, they learned how to fix them. And then that gave birth to the bush mechanics in the 1980s, eventually. So, and that, that they owned a car, they're owning cars in the, like in about 1914s, so that, that's how early they're owning cars. Um, um, we got, we have three minutes left and um, Matt Rowan has been waiting patiently for his question. So one more question, lucky last question, Matt. Hey there. Uh, so that was a wonderful talk and so many of the things you said resonate with me, not just uh, in terms of Aboriginal kids, but I think all kids. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that um, I took away was your comment about fear in that relationship and and part of that fear as you said was is, is fear of being paternalistic or fear of doing something stupid uh -huh. um so i guess one of my questions is how can i contribute how can i help in this without making obvious blunders or you know how, what can i do um well the, the reality is that we probably won't be able to do it without making mistakes and you just gotta do it make mistakes and own it and move on I think is the only way we can do it. Um, Cause if you really think about the relationships, I mean, it, we, we got a dysfunctional relationship really, and it was set up by our history. Um, mm -hmm. It's no one's fault in this room, you know, in terms of that setup. Um, but what we do, what we do now is what's going to change things. You know, if we, we can, you can have the choice of ignoring it and you can have a quite a happy life by ignoring it. Um, people like myself can't unfortunately. Um, but um, you know, what I suppose what I'm saying is that to actually mend that chasm will take a considerable amount of discomfort and a considerable amount of time to do. Um, and we're just going to have to do it and it's going to be a learning process. So the thing that you need to walk, walk into that space with is, is to actually admit. And then one thing I didn't point out in that diagram actually is I had no opportunity. And one thing that happens with non-Indigenous people is, is, is you've got to realise is that you've grown up in a society that's deliberately denied you any access to this type of knowledge. Yeah, You've had no opportunity to learn about Aboriginal people. Um, so you have to walk into that space with that, with that knowledge that you, you're here to learn and to, you're here to interact. Um, but also you go into that space saying, this is what I've learned and this is what I can offer. Yeah. And then it's up to the other people to say, well, you know, I'd really like your help with this then, if you can offer that, you know, and you start in those sorts of relationships. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, on that inspiring and challenging note, um, we are right at the hour, so we'll finish up. But I just want to say, uh, Chris, on behalf of ASEMS, we are truly grateful for your taking the time to come and talk to us today. And I think I can tell from some of the reactions we're getting here that we're all quite inspired uh, by your words. And um, I'm sure there'll probably be some follow up on this as well. I know I'm planning an email so you'll hear from me <laughs> in the next couple of days. So, but thank okay. you very much. We really, really appreciate it. And, all right. um, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Much appreciated. All right. Thank okay. you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. No problem. Bye.